Well friends, we live in an age where there's a great deal of disagreement about the truth. There are so many people peddling different versions of the truth. People often claim that someone is spreading fake news if they don't like what they're saying. Or that we can't know the truth in any given situation. Even sometimes that there is no such thing as absolute truth. But Christians are people who believe in the truth. We believe in the God who does not lie. We follow a saviour who claimed to be the way, the truth and the life. We're people who want to know the truth because we believe that the truth will set us free. But despite our belief in the truth and our desire to know the truth, we also need to understand that there will be people, both from outside and from inside the church, who will try and convince us of an alternative truth, who will try and lead us away from the faith handed down to us from the apostles that we find in the scriptures. Now these false teachers are the concern of the Apostle Paul in this section of Titus chapter 1 that we're looking at today. And as we began looking at Titus, we saw Paul describe himself as a servant of God and an apostle of Christ Jesus, whose mission is to further the faith of God's elect people and to further their knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness. The motivation for which is the hope of eternal life, which as he says, God who does not lie promised before the beginning of time. Now Paul's role is to make this truth known, to preach it and to proclaim the message that has been entrusted to him by God. And what we also saw is that Paul began to hand this responsibility on to Titus, to pass the baton on, who was then to pass it on to others by appointing elders, godly elders and overseers in every town, so that they could, as it says there, encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. Now the job that Paul gave to Titus is vital for the ongoing health and growth of the church. But there was a special urgency with the way he passed it on, because the opposition to the gospel of Jesus was, and still is, real and significant. It's like the difference between the job of an admiral in peacetime versus wartime. The admiral has the responsibility for appointing the commanding officers of the various ships that are under his command. No doubt it's a job that he would always take seriously. But how much more so when he's likely to send that ship into combat? And the success of the war may depend on how the ship's captain that he's appointed does his job. So following Paul's instructions on the qualifications of those elders and overseers in verses 6 to 9, Paul immediately explains why it's so urgent to appoint the right people to these positions. And the reason is because there are many who oppose the gospel. And the ones that Titus appoints will be responsible for refuting these opponents. So now in verse 10, he describes the opponents. He says, For there are many rebellious people, full of meaningless talk and deception, especially those of the circumcision group. And he says in verse 11, They must be silenced. These people are rebelling against the pure gospel that has been taught by Paul and the other apostles, namely the gospel of salvation by God's grace alone, through faith in Christ alone, on the basis of his sacrificial death on the cross alone. Now, of course, rebelling against the gospel of God means that they are also rebelling against God himself. They're claiming to know better than God how we can be saved, and that's definitely rebelling against God. But Paul makes it clear what he thinks of their teachings. He says they're full of meaningless talk and deceptions. Now we might like to know a bit better what these opponents actually said, and Paul will come to that a little bit in this passage. But as a basic insight, we should notice that they will often try to make us doubt the truth 
and the reliability and the importance of the apostles' teachings. Translated into today's terms, they want us to doubt the truth of the Bible. Now, of course, trying to get people to doubt God's words is one of the oldest tricks in the book. Back in the Garden of Eden, the serpent said to Eve, Did God really say? Well, Paul's particular concern are those people of the circumcision group, as he calls them. By that he means those who want followers of Jesus to also follow all the Old Testament Jewish laws, including circumcision for males, which is where the name comes from. Now for Paul, this was more than Jews just wanting to hold on to their cultural distinctives, especially when they wanted non-Jews to start doing this and keeping all these same laws. Apparently some were saying, unless you're circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you can't be saved. At least that's what it says in Acts chapter 15, verse 1. Now to Paul, this was one of the was the biggest threat to the gospel of salvation by grace alone, through faith alone. It was importing the idea of works righteousness back into the Christian message. And he saw it as deadly, but not in the good way that it's sometimes used today. So much so that early in his ministry, when Paul had gone up to Jerusalem and had the argument there with the leaders of the church, he had prevailed. And so in their statement that's recorded in Acts chapter 15, verse 11, they actually said, no, we must not add these requirements to the gospel because we believe it's through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved, just as they are, speaking about the Gentiles. Now, Titus knew all about this. In Galatians chapter 2, Paul, speaking about this visit, says, Yet not even Titus, who was with me, was compelled to be circumcised, even though he was a Greek. I'm sure Titus was pretty glad of that. And yet here on Crete, this is still an issue that Titus had to confront. And the main way that he does it is by appointing elders who would oppose this false teaching. Well, these were a significant group that had to be opposed. In fact, Paul says that they must be silenced. Because, as he says uh, in, back, in verse two, uh, back in verse 2, they're disrupting whole households, brother, verse 12, disrupting whole households by teaching things that they ought not to teach, and that for the sake of dishonest gain. Now, false teachers can have all sorts of different teachings. Sometimes they reduce the gospel down so much that there's no expectation of any change of behavior in response. There's no expectation of godliness. But others can add all sorts of rules and regulations on top. They expect people to try and be right with God by keeping these rules. Now, whether people teach a gospel minus or a gospel plus, anyone who distorts the gospel and leads people away from the true gospel of Jesus is attacking the church by their false teaching. As a result, they will disrupt whole households by teaching falsehoods. Not only that, Paul suggests that their motivations are often about their own gain, whether it's financial, which was common then and still common now, sadly, or for power, or for physical gratification, or for all of the above. Remember, when we looked at uh, what Paul wanted in godly leaders, he said they're not to be greedy or pursuing dishonest gain. So Paul tells Titus to rebuke these people in verse 13. But first he provides a little cultural quote to make the point that, of why they really need to do it. So in verse 12 he says, One of Crete's own prophets has said, Cretans are always liars, evil brutes, lazy gluttons. This saying is true, therefore rebuke them sharply. Now, it might not seem very smart to insult a whole island nation. But Paul seems to think there's some value in mentioning this self-assessment by one of Crete's own prophets. Uh, just to be clear, he's not saying this was a biblical prophet, but a local philosopher who claimed to speak from the local gods. Now, this quote is, and this quote's most often attributed to Epimenides, but there are a number of possibilities. 
Now, Paul is simply saying that nobody should be surprised that false teachers would come from Crete or that they would find people who, who would follow their teachings. But Paul says both the false teachers and those who follow them need to be re rebuked. They need to be confronted. But even then, the goal is not just shutting them down or, or winning points. The purpose and the goal of the rebuke, as Paul says in verses 13 and 14, is their restoration. He says, rebuke them sharply so that they will be sound in the faith and that they will pay no attention to Jewish myths or to the merely human commands of those who reject the truth. Now again, to be clear, the false teachers will often be quoting the Bible or claiming that their teaching comes from God, but they'll be misusing the Bible. They'll be devising their own commands that, in the end, contradict the teachings of Jesus. And from what Paul goes on to say, it seems that these false teachers were trying to teach all sorts of ways to, that people might become pure in God's sight. Probably by baptisms and various washings. The sorts of rituals that some first century Jews drew both from the scriptures and from their traditions. But Paul insists both their minds and their consciences are corrupted, he says in verse 15. And in verse 16... They claim to know God, but by their actions, they deny him. He says they are disobedient, detestable, and unfit for doing anything good. Now that's because we can never be right with God by our religious rituals, no matter how pious they might seem. Because they're not about true godliness, because that is a matter of the heart. Being religious is just about the externals and can never really change our hearts. That requires an operation that God does in us by his Holy Spirit when we put our faith in Jesus. Well, we can only be pure when we've been washed by his blood. Now, for some people, the idea that, that our religious acts can't make us right with God is insulting because we tend to believe that we're basically good and just need a bit of a clean up. Maybe like a car that we think we can make good as new by a little polish. Well, if we stick with the car analogy, in reality, we're more like the rusted out, mechanically dead old wreck. Do we think that a little polish is going to make us good as new? But that's the message that so many false teachers, not only from the first century, but also from today, so many false teachers are wanting us to buy. They want us to buy their idea of a religious fix-up. And we can be tempted into it because we think, well, it might just be possible. We can make a little bit of an effort. The problem is that Jesus doesn't want us to just make a bit of an effort. Jesus died for us so that we could have forgiveness, so that we could be set free to live for him. Giving him a couple of hours of religious activity one day a week, or, or even if we do it every day, that isn't enough. He wants us to trust him with our whole lives. And if we look carefully at the lives of the false teachers, Paul is saying we can actually see that despite their religious piety, their actions never really lined up with their claims. The teachers who really know God and can teach us what it means to follow him are the apostles because they knew Jesus and faithfully following their teaching and their example which we see in the Bible is the best way in fact it's the only way to know God well the description of the false teachers that Paul gives us here gives us three tests that we can apply to any and every religious system that claims to be Christian. We need to ask, first of all, is its origin divine or human? Is it based on the revelation of God or mere human tradition? Secondly, we can ask, is its essence inward of the heart or is it outward? Is it spiritual or is it just ritual? 
And thirdly, is its result a transformed life? Or is it some, merely some formal creed? You see, true religion is divine in origin. It's thoroughly biblical. It's spiritual in its essence. It transforms our hearts. And it's moral in its effects. It leads us to true godliness without being moralistic. Friends, the warning in this passage about the danger of false teachers is for all of us to note. Certainly it is the responsibility of elders and overseers both to teach the true gospel and to refute those who teach things made up by humans. But in fact, every believer has a responsibility to test and to weigh what they are being taught. And the only way any of us can do that is to know God's word so well that we can recognize when we're being taught a counterfeit. And it's also true that we should be in enough of a relationship with our leaders to know when their lifestyle don't match up to God's standards. Not overbearing, not quick-tempered, not given to drunkenness, not greedy, as we heard last week. Rather, our leaders ought to be hospitable, lovers of good, self-controlled, upright, holy and disciplined. And if we do have confidence in our local leadership, then we really should support them. But we also have the opportunity to encourage and pray for and to support those who are being trained elsewhere. Like the student that we've recently adopted by our church from Africa. There are many others who meet the godliness characteristics Paul spells out, but need good biblical and theological training at colleges that are faithful to the scriptures. Friends, in the end, we all can and need to play our role, big or small, in supporting the spread of the truth about Jesus, in opposing the false teaching, which does so much damage to the lives of individual believers, as well as to the church as a whole. Let's commit ourselves to doing our part. Will you pray with me? Father God, we thank you for the gospel of your salvation through Jesus Christ. We thank you for the great news that you have sent your Son into the world to provide forgiveness of our sins through faith in him alone, on the basis of his work alone. Father, we pray that you might help us to so know your word that we might be protected from false teaching. Please raise up godly and gifted leaders who will defend the truth, teach it and refute those who teach false teachings. Lord, we pray that each one of us might know your word so well that we can recognize any kind of false teaching when we hear it so that each one of us might be able to play our role. Help us to be committed to living godly lives ourselves and supporting those who lead us. Help us to encourage them to live in a way that honours you and to teach the truth of your gospel. And Father God, we pray that you might continue to raise up godly people to be the elders and leaders of our churches. Especially, Lord, we pray for those places where they don't have easy access to faithful Bible teaching institutions and, and places to train, but that in your mercy, you might raise up those people and give them the training that they need. Father, help us to be supporters of that in whatever way we can. We pray this in the name of your Son, our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, and for his glory. Amen. Well, friends, thanks for being with me. I look forward to seeing you next time. God bless.